Good morning, everybody. Um, today, in this talk, I will be presenting Metabolism, which is a new feature added to Charm Plus Plus, which helps in deciding the load balancing related decisions which are currently taken by the user. I'll start the talk with a motivation and then go into a brief overview of what Metabalancer is. And then I will briefly discuss what the current um, load balancing framework is in Charm Plus Plus followed by the details of in detail description of meta balancer and then the conclusion and future work. As we know, the balancing decisions do affect the application performance as well as the scale of EP. So currently, the application program has to decide what the load balancing parameters are. They have to decide upfront or during runtime and Usually what they do is uh, they would experiment a lot, try different strategies, and then come up with a strategy that best, best fits the application. So this requires multiple run of the application, and then it is tough to this, uh, judge uh, what is the correct load balancing parameter. Apart from that, we have a large set of dynamic applications in which the load balancing parameters change as the application proceeds. For example, in certain applications, in one phase we will require frequent load balancing, whereas in other phase we don't need load balancing at all. <coughs> so here is where we need an automatic um, uh, agent which looks at the application characteristics and decides the load balancing parameters that are done. So we know that the charm RPS monitors the application. It maintains the LD database which contains the information about the charge communication pattern as well as the load of a particular charge and the processor. Charm RPS is also aware of the system characteristics. So it seems best to offload the load balancing decisions to the charm RPS rather than put the burden on the application programmer. And this is what the meta load balancer is doing. Meta load balancer is a Another component uh, is a new component added to the charm RPS, which takes these load balancing decisions without the user involvement. So currently, what the meta balancer is capable of doing is it decides what the frequency of load balancing is. That is, how frequently do we need to call the load balancer? Or is there a need to call the load balancer at all? It also automatically triggers the load balancing. Um, it keeps track of what is the persistence of the application and any time it finds the application uh, doesn't fit into the, uh, or the application characteristic team suddenly and you need to do load balancing, it triggers the load balancing. Apart from that, meta balancer is also capable of choosing which strategy that, uh, which strategy should be kicked in to do the load balancing. For example, some applications are either computationally intensive and some of them have communication overhead. So depending on what the characteristics of the application is, the meta balancer identifies that and kicks in the appropriate load balancing strategy. Now, now I'll talk about the existing framework that we have in Charm++. The user is the one who decides what the LB frequency is and what strategy to use for their application. And the control flow goes like this. Whenever we need to do the load balancing, an at sync call is made. The RTS forces the uh, local barrier, which is at the level of a processor, and then a global barrier to collect all the uh, database, the statistics regarding the processor load. And then uh, once the load balancing strategy has been executed, it informs all the process and does the migration, and the application resumes. With the meta balancer, the meta balancer periodically collects the statistics during an application run. Every processor contributes its statistics. Based on the stats collected, the central processor finds what is the ideal LB period and informs every processor. If the LB is required immediately, it kicks in. And during the load balancing phase, the root, the central processor decides which load balancing strategy to use. Now I'll talk about how this the stats collection is happening. So stats collection is done via Charm's asynchronous reduction mechanism. It needs to be asynchronous because we, since the stats is being collected very frequently, we can't afford to have any sort of local or a global barrier because that will incur a lot of overhead. 
apart from being asynchronous, it collects only very minimal set of stats. Like what is the maximum load on any processor in the system? What is the average load? And what is the minimum utilization? This gives an indication of what are the applic what is the application characteristic and what kind of load balancing strategy we need. So here is a pictorial representation of that. The key thing to notice, note, note here is every processor has multiple charts running on them, uh, executing on them. After every iteration, the, the processor waits for all its charts to finish a particular iteration before sending the uh, statistics. Here PE0 sends its stats for iteration 1 very quickly and PE1 sends it only later. But PE0 doesn't have to wait for PE1 to finish the iteration 1. Instead, it can go ahead and continue with its work. Similarly, none of the charts have to wait for other charts in the processor to finish a particular iteration. So this reduces the, this doesn't incur any overhead due to that stats collection. And since it's a reduction mechanism, asynchronous reduction, it, there is no overhead, much overhead. Once all the stats have been collected, how do we identify the ideal LP period? We know that load balancing removes the imbalance of load and thereby increases the performance. But this also incurs a cost. The cost involves data movement and the strategy to identify the new mapping of objects onto processors. So the ideal performance is obtained when we get the maximum benefit of load balancing despite the fact that we have incurred a certain cost for the load balancing. So to identify the ideal LB period, let's assume that the average and the max max load of a system can be represented in a straight line. Then to find the total execution time, we, in, we find the curve, well, we find the area of the max curve under the max curve and that will be the total execution time plus the load balancing cost. Now we try, uh, now we integrate this to obtain the minimum total execution time for the given thing. And we find that the ideal LB period is directly proportional to the cost of load balancing and inversely proportional to how fast the max increases. So if, if we have a huge LB cost, then the LB period is expected to be large because we have to um, get the benefit of doing load balancing. So to verify, and this, this, has, this is being used by the meta balancer to identify the ideal LB period. So here to verify this concept, um, I use a micro benchmark, which is Jacobi 2D. The max, of, max load on the system is slowly changing. On the y-axis, we have the elapsed time uh, of the application, and on x-axis is the LB period. So we find that the ideal LB period is around 150 to 250 uh, iterations, and the, good, uh, the, the, the best performance is about 5.3 seconds. The other thing to note is that if we do the load balancing too frequently, then it incurs a lot of overhead due to load balancing. And the benefit of doing load balancing is offset by the uh, LB cost. But if we don't do load balancing at all, then we lose out on the performance because of the, uh, because of the imbalance in the system. That's like a 2D stencil. Yes. That has no no, this was an artificial benchmark that was written to, with the, uh, with, the, with the artificially incurred um, load of balance, which continues to change, which continues to change over the period of time. So here is the um, here is the uh, here is how the meta balancer performs on this particular benchmark. On the y-axis is the iteration time per iteration time and the x-axis is the iteration. So in the beginning, um, so on the red curve is the max curve and the green curve is the average curve. In the beginning, meta balancer notices that there is a high imbalance and kicks in load balancing immediately. But then it finds that the ideal period is about 150 to 250 range, which is what will be found by the experimentation. And it kicks in load balancing at that frequency. 
only then we get the off benefit of doing load balancing. So as we saw before that uh, we don't have any local barrier or a global barrier to, while we are collecting the stats. So now we need to ensure that uh, so when the load balancing period has been decided, it is informed to all the processors. But some of the charts might have gone beyond that particular uh, period. So we need to have a consensus mechanism to make sure that all the charts are in particular iteration and then carry out the load balancing process. Also, as the application, as more and more statistics are collected, we are able to refine the LB period and, uh, and find a better LB period. So this, there needs to be a capability of refining the LB period, expanding and contracting the LB period. Also, if all of a sudden the characteristics of the application changes, this load balancing needs to kick in. Once we have decided the load balancing period, what kind of strategy will the load balancer, will the meta balancer use? So the application can be of um, multiple types. Some of them are computationally intensive. Some of them are communica communication bound. Some of them have a mixture of two. So the meta balancer uses the alpha beta cost to identify the character, what kind of application it is. The alpha beta cost consists of the cost of message sent. Alpha is the cost of message, each message being sent. Beta is the bandwidth cost of the system. So once it notices the alpha beta cost is considerable, for example, at least 10 percent of the total load, it is an indication that this application is communication bound. So it kicks in strategies which are communication aware. For example, we have in Charm plus plus we have different kinds of load balancing strategy. For communication aware, we have Meta, Scotch, and Zoltan LB. For um, load imbalance strategy, we have a variety of them, greedy, refined, et cetera, being a few of them. So the other thing about deciding a strategy is the refined versus comprehensive. In comprehensive strategy, the mapping of the objects onto a processor is done from scratch without the knowledge of the previous mapping. This incurs a lot of migration cost and adds to the LP cost. So it is not preferred, but meta balancer calls this as the first step of the load balancing followed by the refinement based strategies. If the refinement strategies do well enough. So here I present few results. Yeah. Sorry, you, you mentioned the cost of uh, comprehensive. Then it, it's done without reference, and therefore it can migrate every object. Uh, yes. Uh, what is there anything so that you want to use it for the first time? Yes, because the refinement strategies are usually not able to obtain the perfect load balancing, whereas the scratch-based load balancing strategies obtain a better load load balance. So probably better to say refinement seeks a local minima in the yes. nearby. Yeah. Okay. So it is preferable to use com uh, comprehensive at the beginning. And then if refinement can do its job well, then we use that. So here are a few um, uh, app runs that I've um, made to explore the benefit of using Meta Balancer. This is a LeanMD mini application. On the y-axis is the uh, load per iteration. And on the x-axis is the iteration. As we see that in the beginning, there is a huge imbalance in load. So the meta balancer identifies this, kicks in the load balancing immediately. After this point, it notices there is no, no imbalance at all. I mean, there is only very less imbalance, about 1% imbalance. So it doesn't kick in load balancing. It, has a, it finds an LB period of around 700 to 800 iterations. So it doesn't kick in load balancing during this period. And this is what is expected. The other example here is K-neighbor in contrast to LeanMD. Where here we, again, in the, in the y-axis, we have the ratio of the, the red curve is idle time, how much idle time is there in the system. The other one is the imbalance ratio. So as we see, there is no imbalance at all in k-neighbor. But k-neighbor is a, to, to describe what k-neighbor is, k-neighbor is a micro benchmark in, written in CHAM++. It has a high a communication uh, involved in it. So even though there is no load imbalance, there is heavy communication. So the meta balance identifies that there is enough idle time, to, which is accounted due to the message delay, and also finds that the alpha beta cost is very high. 
So it kicks in the load balancing in the beginning and it kicks in the com communication aware load balancer, either Metascotch or Zolt. Here's another example where <coughs> we have modified the same key, key neighbor benchmark to not have an imbalance in the beginning and then have a sudden imbalance and what we see here is the meta balancer identifies that there is a sudden imbalance in load and kicks in load balancing uh, during this phase. To conclude, um, we know that load imbalance does affect the performance of an application and scalability. So there needs to be uh, a way of deciding what, what the ideal load balancing parameters are. Putting the all the, uh, leaving all this to be handled by the application program uh, seems to be unreasonable and inefficient. So we have a meta balancer, which releases the user of the load balancing decisions. It frequently collects the stats without much overhead and decides what the load balancing decisions are. We plan to expand the strategy to hybrid and centralized and topology aware and uh, topology oblivious. Then we'll have more predictions of the load, better predictions of the load. Thank you. Are there any questions? So, presuming you have an application currently which uses uh, user decided load balancer, how do you migrate to use the meta balancer? Um, the meta balancer will be of, uh, inherently called in, uh, when the load balancing strategy is called. So the key thing to know is the user has to specify a small um, load balancing period, like every two iterations, so that the stats get collected. But they have to just specify instead of there will be an adaptive LB. But with they, we plan to incorporate what kind of load balancer to use for now. The adaptive LB uses either greedy, refined, metis, scotch or resolvent. So instead of that, we'll also provide parameters for the user to specify in case of um, communication, use this particular load balancer. In case of anything else, use this particular load balancer. But for now, it should work uh, from scratch. Uh, if they just specify plus balance at their LB, it should automatically kick in the adapter. So if libraries like Scotch or Golden and State implemented algorithms that were less heavyweight or were more oriented towards dynamic load balancing, how would that change the meta balancer? We do use uh, Zoltan LB. There's Zoltan hypergraph partition as a balancing load balancing strategy in Champ++. We do use that. No, no, but my question is that those algorithms are kind of like hypergraph partitioning, those are kind of heavyweight algorithms. Right. right? right. So if, if they changed their algorithms so that they were more lightweight, how would that change the meta balance? Oh, I see. So since the meta balance it takes into cost of load balancing strategy, it notices the hypergraph partitioner would take, let's say, seven seconds to finish the load balancing strategy. It would call the hypergraph partitioner very infrequently. But if they improve their algorithms, the, and the time of the strategy becomes lesser, and they reduce the migration, that would automatically, the meta balance would ensure that if there is an imbalance that could be mitigated by calling the strategy, it would call frequently. But, but it, it, it's based on observations of the previous times. Yes. Not some knowledge that it has improved. Okay. But, but it's based on the measurement. measurement. Measure. Okay. This is another, another uh, lightweight uh, issue question here which is that, say, suppose I'm using Zoltan, I'm using Scotch or Metis. Usually, in scientific applications, using them to partition the mesh itself. Uh, could you comment on how you're using, what is the use of uh, Scotch or Metis that you're doing? So, we have the object graph in Charm++, uh, where the edges are the communication between the chars, and the load of the processor is the vertex load. And we use these graph partitioners to divide these object, the, the object graph into partitions, and these partitions will be mapped onto each processor. So, we so what's the size of the mesh typically? Mesh size, for example, if it is a, a 64 uh, processors, the size of the mesh would be... You meant 64,000 processors. We don't talk about 64,000. Now, this is a sort of <laughs> example. So it would be multiplied by 8. So the VP, the... the, the the number of objects mapped onto a particular processor or a particular partition is 
is just 8 or 10 or 16 in that order as compared to the actual mesh partition where there will be multiple vertices mapped onto a particular partition. Yeah. Uh, because the system does incur a, a specific cost in sending a particular message out. But so that you do this is to identify whether it is a communication intensive benchmark, as the beta cost is basically used for that particular purpose. Uh, I'm not sure if I am got the question correct or answer it. Thank you.